when it's getting darker each moment and God reaches out his hands to us as his followers to join him in this very painful and dark season and to ask us to walk with him as he takes us through this difficult journey. And that's what we're going to be studying today, the darkness of death and the assurance that even in death, we have life. We are in the study. It is the miracles in the Bible, and we will be studying the series from different perspectives. Today, we are in the miracle of Lazarus, and if you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn with me to John chapter 11 and verse 1 to 16. But as we always do before we go into the study, I just want to remind us that while the Bible has nearly 160 plus key miracles, but there is one miracle that is known as the greatest of all. And the greatest miracle of all is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Never has there been nor is as we live in this world, or will ever be a more powerful miracle than the miracle of salvation. If you are saved, you need to praise be to God that he found you in your sin. He has given you, in exchange for your sin, he has given you the gift of salvation. If you're here tonight and you do not know this true gift of salvation that comes through knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to stay back tonight and talk to somebody here. Or you can open up your heart and invite him. The days are hard. The days are evil. But when we come to this living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the living God reveals himself through his beautiful son. And his son does a wonderful miracle that the Bible talks about and I would encourage you to get to know him in today's study. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise you for the gift of life. The greatest of all miracles is the gift of salvation. What a privilege and an honor it is for us to know that our sins have not been washed in part but in whole. It is nailed to the cross and we know it no more. What a privilege and honor it is for us to say thank you, Jesus, for the blood that was poured on Calvary's cross. Tonight, as we come to you, dear Father, we just lift up our hands in worship to the great I am. Father, we lift up our hands in surrender to the great I am. And Father, we lift up our hearts and our hands in openness and say, Lord, speak because we receive your word. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would you come and dwell among us? Would you disturb us tonight? Many of us need you. And tonight it's our prayer that we will be touched, to be drawn to the heart of the Father, to know his purposes through his Son, and to live in the power of his Holy Spirit. We dedicate this time to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just like all miracles in the Bible, this miracle of Lazarus also starts with a really big problem. When you look at John chapter 11, John, the disciple of Christ, is opening this chapter up by mentioning the name of a man called Lazarus and says, this man Lazarus is sick. Now, this man is from the town called Bethany, and he was known more better as the brother of Mary and Martha. This was the same Mary that is spoken about here, who in previous chapters had poured perfume on the Lord Jesus Christ and wiped his feet with her hair. These sisters sent word to Jesus and said, Lord, 
the one whom you love is sick. Now, this family loved God, and this family was also loved by Jesus. Whenever Jesus would come to town, he would stay with him. Historians say that there was a special affinity that Jesus had to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He enjoyed their fellowship. He enjoyed the time that he spent talking to these sisters and the brother. And he had a special relationship with them. One that many of us possibly wish that we could also have with Jesus. Have him to come sit at the table, laugh with us, chat with us, cry with us, teach us the scriptures. Jesus had that very special relationship. Now, it is very interesting to know the word Lazarus and this parable. Now, for us who live on this side of the cross, 2,023 years later, we get to know the story. But I'm going to encourage you to be present and join the crowd as this, this, as this passage is actually discussed tonight. We know the whole story, but in context, Lazarus was sick. And using the verge of dying, his sisters called Jesus and say, come and heal my brother. And we all know the story, Jesus does not come. But the paradox in this, the name Lazarus, it means God is my help. And Jesus doesn't come and help. So when you look at these two, it is a bit of a very odd situation here. In the early ages, Jewish, the Jewish culture, the names were associated with a special circumstance or even with a divine act from the Almighty God. And here was Lazarus given this beautiful name. In, in Jewish culture, it was called Eliezer. In, in the Greek language of translation, it means God is my help. And God did not help him that day. He died. And now I would encourage you to enter into John, teaching us some very precious lessons from this miracle. So the first lesson we learn in this miracle is, Jesus loved them, so he waited. Because he loved them, he waited. When you look at verse 3 to 6, the sisters therefore sent him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. In other words, claiming a spirit special agape position of Jesus and Lazarus. And when Jesus heard it, he said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sisters and Lazarus. Now, this is John the Baptist, John, the person who, who, who leaned on, 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 on the bosom of the Lord Jesus. It's such a close intimacy. He is capturing this. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When therefore he had heard that he was sick, he stayed then two days longer in the place where he was. The key factor in this for us to know is because Jesus loved them, he waited. For many of us, we think because Jesus loves me, he has to answer me right away. May we never forget that Jesus loves us and there is a full stop. Many of us say Jesus loves me and then we go to the next step and say, but Lord, can you do this for me? In this passage, it is very clear. He loves them and he waits in the crisis situation not to go to them because he has his appointed time. Now, Jesus was actually staying about two miles where Lazarus was. 45 minutes walk. He didn't take a Uber taxi to go, so it was 45 minutes to go. So he could have come when he got the message. But he did not come when he was needed. His love for them was the reason why he did not want to go immediately to heal Lazarus. It is not that he rejected the request. It is not that he denied the request. It was that he accepted the invitation, but he said, I am going to respond, but I'm going to respond in my own way, so I'm going to wait. It is counterintuitive, you see, this evening. For us as human understandings, it is counterintuitive because Lazarus is dying. He needs help. He has an identity that says, I'm walking around this world known as Lazarus. God is my help. And when I need him the most, he does not come. So sisters plead on his behalf. He still doesn't come. On the other hand, we also see that there's another reason, possibly some of the interpreters say that 
There was no reason for him to go because he stayed back because it was the same place a few days ago where he was ready to be stoned. If you read John chapter 10 and verse 31, the Jews took up stones to stone him when he was there. But let's be clear, no matter what, he, his waiting had nothing to do with the circumstance of what the world says. His waiting was he loved them. When God does not respond to us right away or when he waits for us to respond, it is his love that is keeping him from acting on our behalf. I wonder this evening, are you waiting for God to act? Are you waiting helplessly? Are you waiting so much that you've been praying and saying, Lord, come, help me. And you know that he helps. And you have seen many circumstances in other people's lives when you have called and, they, and God responds and he has helped. And today perhaps you are waiting. <coughs> Remember, God loves you, so he is waiting. He's working even when you and me don't see it. He has already responded to you, and he wants you to know, my child, I love you so much that I would rather wait than to come as soon as you call. As disciples of Christ, and we live in a world where we want our faith to be immediately acted upon, we want this God of the Bible to immediately jump out of the book of its pages and see us. In Lazarus's case, it never happened. And perhaps in many of our cases, it's not happening. He loved them, so he waited. That was lesson number one. Lesson number two, he came at his ordained time. There was a time that was chosen of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come. Look at verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days in other words, God has an ordained time, <coughs> but in human terms, Jesus came four days late. God's time and man's time. Man wants God to come right now, and Jesus says, I have my ordained time. Lord, you are late, and Jesus said, I'm on time. It's contradictory. Why? Because in God's time and in God's purpose and plan, by the point by the time that Jesus had come to Lazarus, Lazarus was legally dead. Why? We have to go back and understand this phrase because in Jewish custom, they would wait until the fourth day to legally pronounce the person is dead. That is a schism. There's a belief that happens in the Jewish culture that for three days the spirit has left the body and it is circling around the body so that the spirit would be within three days trying to get back in case the body comes back. Now, it's all just a belief, but it never happens that way. So the tradition was for them to wait for four days for the Jewish community to say he has been pronounced dead and that he is truly dead. Jesus arrives after Lazarus' illness has resulted in life leaving his body. So on the fourth day, Jesus arrives. Now, when Jesus arrives, the professional mourners in the Jewish community, when somebody dies, they will cry, but they'll pay money for others to come and to wail over the body. So you've got to pay for somebody to, to actually cause you grief. When some of them cry, you'll have grief and you'll actually get more grief because they do it in a particular way that breaks you. So Jesus had to saw them. The mourners are also paid. They have been crying and they have left. Jesus arrives. They have already prepared the body for burial. They have wrapped the body in grave clothes. In Jesus' time, the Jewish tradition, the body was washed and it was anointed with expensive perfumes like nard and myrrh and aloes. It was put together in layers. It was not just placed and left alone. It was wrapped up and it was wrapped in multiple layers because it was kind of embalmed. And then the body was placed in a burial ground inside the rock. And here we find that everything was done. And here was Lazarus inside the tomb. His hands and feet tied up and stirred up together and bound together and he is placed there. And Jesus comes, and four days have gone away. 
When Jesus arrives, the Jews actually tell him, he's legally dead. Why are you coming to the graveside? In human terms, it might be like people are saying, is he crazy? Could he have not healed this man? He's late. But Jesus says, this is my time. But Lord, he's dead. Now we can see the picture because we have to know that we need to ask ourselves, is Jesus never late, but he's always on time? Is that really true in our lives? He's never late. But Lord, you're never late. You're always on time, but it is not my time. And God says, what time do you need? My ordained time or your desired time? Mary and Martha, both of them together in different times in that small context say, Lord, if only you had been here. Four days ago, if only you had come, my brother would not have died. This would have never happened. Lord, our desire would have been fulfilled. <coughs> our needs would have been met, Lord. And Lord, your dear friend whom you loved so much, you could have sat with him. You could have laughed with him. You could have had a meal with him. You could have spoken about the, the news and spoken about the community. We could have chatted together, Lord. But Lord, he's dead. Lord, he's dead. And for many of us, when our times don't get past, we are heartbroken. No matter what, we should be very careful to not ask, we should not rush God to act on our behalf. Today, are you tired? Sitting here in IFNWA, praying, asking, pleading, and saying, God, where are you? Perhaps you've been praying for something, and the circumstances of what you're praying for has actually moved on. And you feel like, what's the use of praying? It's dead. Perhaps you're wondering that you, these circumstances, God's not going to act. Perhaps it's over. Why should I continue to ask. Well, I want to read to you a quote from an anonymous, an anonymous writer. This is what he says. Delays are not refusals. Many a prayer is registered and underneath it's the words, my time has not yet come. You see, as followers of Christ, we find it real hard to accept God's time. And many of us are like this impatient gardeners that we plant seeds of rose flowers. We see the bud coming up. We see the bud and we are so happy that our labors have now got fruit. So we have a bud. And because we don't want to wait for the bud to slowly each pod open up, we take the bud and we force open the rose petals. And we are getting ahead of the creator. Then we come and say, oh, but it got destroyed. And God says, it is not your time, my child, to open up the bud. It is my time because I am the creator. And many of us today are sitting here because of the choices we have made. When God says, delays are not my refusals, my time has not come. He came at his ordained time. He loved them so he waited to come. And he came at the ordained time. The third lesson that we read here is he revealed his identity and his relationship that he had to the Father. This is a beautiful passage to read, and we don't have time, but I'm just going to quickly glance through it. I would encourage you to go home and read it. Look at verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The book of John, the Gospel of John, has seven identities of seven names of the I am. Jesus presents those seven names, and one of this is I am the resurrection. Now, this is Jesus revealing his power of who he is, his identity. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you, Martha believe in this if you notice here jesus he's not saying anything else he says i am the resurrection of life jesus is not claiming to have resurrection 
and also have life, or he understands the secrets about resurrection and life. Instead, Jesus is saying that he is the resurrection and the life. To know Jesus is to know resurrection and life. And this is the greatest gift to us. And we live because he lives. No, we quickly say it, right? But I'd ask for you to pause when you read this. Jesus lives, so I live. Jesus died, so I live. It's very hard for us to comprehend this. But I ask you to enter into the purpose of this. Why? Because Charles Spurgeon captures it the best way. If you look at this quote, death cannot kill a believer. It can only usher him into a freer form of life. I'd love for you to, to think about these statements. Death cannot kill a believer can only usher him into a freer form of life. Jesus did not expound and say, Martha, you need to understand. I'm here because I know about resurrection. Martha, you need to know that I know how life happens. He didn't say anything. He says, I am. He was preparing her for the next three weeks of him going to the cross. Dead, being buried, and rising on the third day. Because what he was going to do then was he was going to give not only Martha and Mary and the whole community, but the whole the, of, the, of the community that day and the ages to come until his coming, that anybody who knows him will know him as the resurrection and the life. This wasn't just another statement. This was Jesus calling the entire world to him in this one statement. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he turns to her and says, Martha, do you believe this? Like many of us, just like how she says, when Jesus says, do you believe it? We immediately say, yes, Lord, I believe it. However, that belief within few minutes changed. If you look at verse 40 of this chapter, and Jesus said to her, and let's read 39. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the disease, said, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said, Martha, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Martha, do you believe me? Yes. And within a few moments, the intellect takes place. The emotion goes away. The intellect takes place and say, Lord, don't move the stone, Lord. Do something else. Isn't that us today? But you have to understand what was happening over here was that what Jesus was telling her is this, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Question, do I need to see the glory of God when my brother is dead? How can somebody see the glory of a living God in a situation when there is death and decay? When I am suffering in pain, when I am grieving, Lord, how can I and my immediate family see your glory? Well, famous Christian author Jerry Bridges ties it up from a human perspective and makes a lot of sense. I'd like you to look at this in his book from Trusting God. He says, God never pursues his glory at the expense of the good of his people. Nor does he ever seek our good at the expense of his glory. He has designed his eternal purpose so that his glory and our good are inextricably bound together. In your painful circumstances, you will see the glory of God. No matter how hard it is, Martha, would you believe me? I, I feel your pain, Martha. I love you so much, Martha. But would you believe me, Martha, that you will see the glory of God? Dear brothers and sisters, may we never dichotomize our suffering and God's glory. God is not a God who sits up there and says, let me make you painful so that I can have my own way. He always comes to us and says, it is together that my eternal purposes will be done. That's the reason why he kept on asking Martha, Martha, do you believe Martha, do you believe? And what was God actually tell, Jesus telling her is, Martha, stop thinking, stop living with your head. 
live with your heart. We live in a world where people tell us, oh, you're the right side of your brain has to work hard because that is the place where you need to, you need to rationalize, you need to have logic. It doesn't make any sense, dear brother and sister, if you're sitting here and trying to live this life, understanding this God with your intellect. Your intellect didn't bring you into the world. Your intellect will not take you out of the world. Let your intellect find its place for what God has purposed, but you come to him with your heart. And that's the reason why he says, Martha, did I not tell you to believe? He was revealing his identity. I am the resurrection and the life. But he didn't stop there. He's introducing a very special emphasis because this was the crowd. This wasn't Martha, Mary, and Lazarus in the grave. It was the whole community. Remember, this community wanted to stone him a few days ago. And he's standing there. He's doing the unthinkable. Look at verse 41 and 42. So they said, remove the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast already heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always because of the people standing around, I said it, that they may believe that thou didst send me. Jesus says, I am the resurrection, the life. And now he goes to the next level and he says, Father, you and me, you already heard me. He was actually talking about his relationship with his heavenly father. The folks there knew that he was the son of Joseph. But Jesus has been telling them, my father is the one who sent me. And here what he's doing is, he is actually revealing who, not only his identity, but, the, but he's actually revealing the purpose for which he was sent in response to the Father sending him. I have a relationship with Yahweh, the heavenly God. I want to think about you and me. If you were there, standing in that crowd and hearing this, you would be looking for stones. Because here you would find that this man is again blaspheming. If you read John chapter 10 and verses uh, 33, Jesus said to him, for a good work we do not, the Jews answered him, sorry, the Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. He's back again saying the same wrong things. And I want you to know what happened that day is what Jesus was doing It was again saying who he was and who he is. 2,023 years later, he is the same God. Amen. I wonder whether you know him. Maybe it's a head telling you something and your heart not able to understand it. Even today, God is revealing his identity to many people. Some are willfully telling him no. Some are saying, maybe not now. And some are embracing him. Some of us are in that category there. Every moment of it, the day of our lives. You know, Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, I watch you sleep. Morning by morning, I wake you up. I, the heavenly God, wake you up to reveal my identity to you, to tell you all that is in my heart. But some of us are so fast asleep and we're busy with the world that when God wakes us up, we keep walking and doing our own thing. Just like how he revealed his identity and his relationship to the Father. Even right now, he's doing it to you. If you do not know this Jesus, or if you've known this Jesus and you do not know him, but know about him, perhaps this evening he wants to tell you, do you really believe? Then you will see my glory. The third lesson we read is he revealed his identity and his relationship to the Father. And the last thing, The last lesson is, he fulfilled what he came to do. Look at verse 43. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And verse 44. And he who had died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around it with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. It is interesting that Jesus gave a personal invitation to and said, Lazarus, come forth. If he just had to say, come forth, every grave would have opened up. Everybody would have come. They would all seen their relatives passed dead years ago. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he call him by name? Jesus never calls a person on the crowds. 
The God that you and me worship is a God of relationship. He loves you. Yes, he died for mankind, but he loves you. He wanted people to know, Lazarus, you love me. I also love you. So I will call you out, Lazarus. And Lazarus, and the word of the Lord says, and Lazarus came out. Let us not forget in this passage how he came out. As I told you, if you, if you remember, if you recollect, when they embalmed the body, they use aloe and myrrh and they wrap it. They embalm the body. They tie you up like this so you have layers and layers. Your feet and your hands are all tied. And then they place a cloth on your face and you are buried. If you read the tradition of how they bury the Jews, there's about nearly 80 to 100 pounds, about 50 kgs, 30 to 40 kgs of embalming that takes place. And it's dry. And if you're tied, my question is, how can you walk? And you have to understand, if you read in history, the Jews would, they would actually make a hole in the cave and they'll go in and they'll place it, it's called an apustry, they'll place the body down, there is a layer and it's a step and it goes down. Now, if Lazarus is born and Jesus says, unbind him and let him go, my question to you is, how did he come out? This is where you see the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who, who raised Lazarus up and brought him out. That is the reason why Jesus tells him, untie him and let him go. Why did Jesus not untie him? Because Jesus wanted them to be part of that miracle. Because the guy who, and the people who went around Lazarus and untied him, every day, they would have been surprised. Wow, I untied him. I saw his face first. I let him go. It would have been a big community affair, right? Trying to get him out. Because it was a community affair in wrapping him and putting him together. And here is the community that buried this dead man is now bringing this dead man out, releasing this dead man, unbinding him and letting him to go. And it's so true even today that Jesus invites us by the power of the Holy Spirit. When he speaks the word, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts people. But all that Jesus says to you and to me, he says, hey, unbind him. He does all the work. He invites you and me to untie people and let them go. Lazarus Come forth. He fulfilled what he came to do. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, lesson number one, he loved them so he waited. He came to, at his ordained time. He revealed his identity. The death wasn't that Lazarus should be raised from the dead. The death was for the world to know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. They need to hear that. And then he said, okay, you've got to know who I am. Now I will fulfill why I came late. It is my plan. So what is the lessons for us here? The miracle is one filled with God's amazing love. When you read this passage, the Holy Spirit, I was on a flight out from UK this whole week. I was flying back over the weekend preparing my sermon on the long flight. The Lord was just reminding me for the first time in all my years of reading this passage, Silas, this is about my love. This is a passage God's love and his perfect ways. You and me are reminded because he loves us, he tells you and me, wait. Wait for his time. Believe in him. Believe in him as the one who is our resurrection and life. And we join him in this life transformation that God brings. He brings, from, he brings death. From death he brings life. That is the God that you and me worship. So he tells you and me, if you pray, trust in me. You've asked of me. It is ordained of me to come. I will come, but let it be my time. Never give up. Just because in your understanding, it looks like he is delaying. And when you understand that, he asks you and me to look at the world around us and he invites you each day. Each day, remove the barrier, remove the stone, roll away the stone. There are dead people in this world. I want them. I need them. Remove the barrier. I want people to come out. I want people to come out. I will call them by name. You, you allow me to just do my work. 
Many of us talk, take the role of the Holy Spirit, right? Many of us start playing God when we see a non-Christian. And we say, oh, you need to hear the gospel. And we go after them without realizing that God loves that person. He or she is dead. And you and me are just called to remove the barriers that are keeping people from coming out to Jesus Christ. Let the Holy Spirit move. You untie him and let him go. Disciple the person. Don't bring the person into salvation. You and me have to be very careful because that's the reason why Jesus was saying, you buried this person. You untie him. You let him go. Can't the God who called him out also go and set him free? That's the joy of letting the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work in today's life. And that's the reason why you and me are called to believe in this resurrection and life, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is always performing great miracles today. Constantly, the greatest miracle he is performing is the gift of salvation to this world. Have you, in every circumstance, removed the barriers that are keeping people from knowing the Lord? If not, perhaps tonight, if you know this Jesus, perhaps ask the Lord, Lord, how can I do this? And sometimes we say, God, that person can never be saved. He's dead, Lord. Mary and Martha said the same thing. But the Lord said, would you believe? You will see my glory. This beautiful miracle talks about the love of a father who sent his son and the son who obeyed the father and said, Father, I will go and share my love to this people. I love Lazarus. I love Mary. I love Martha. But I also want people, whenever they read this passage, to know how much I love them. I will call the name. You remove the barrier. Let people come out and let them be. Untie them and let them go. Tonight, as God loves you, are you like Mary and Martha saddened that God's not hearing your prayer? Are you disappointed that your prayers have hit the roof and nothing? Or are you angry with God at the things that you have asked him that he has not responded? Do not give up. Because he has an ordained time. He loves you. So he's asking you to wait. And when he comes, he will call out the name. And he will set you free. This chapter talks about a miracle that is so close to the heart of the father. It says, my son is the resurrection and the life. You come and join him. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, as we conclude tonight's service, dear child of God who knows this living God, how do you know him? He is the resurrection and the life. In this journey of discipleship, are you giving up? He wants to tell you that he loves you. He wants to encourage you tonight that he is able to bring death, bring life from death and from darkness bring forth life. Are you crying out to the Lord and waiting? He's heard you, my child. In his time, he will answer you. And when he comes, he will called by name and like he brought Lazarus he will bring forth everything that you need into life will you surrender to this living God and father this evening we are grateful to you that we have the honor and the privilege to be taught by the Holy Spirit we did not come here to listen to the words of man, but we came to meet our Savior, the resurrection and the life. And tonight, Lord, we are grateful to you for the lessons we have learned. Father, we bow down before you 
in your son's holy and powerful name. We say, Lord, have mercy upon us. We bless you. We praise you. That we have the gift of life and we have it abundantly. So as you lead us in this broken world, it's our prayer that we would follow you faithfully. Give us strength to endure. Encourage our hearts each moment. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, empower us and lead us. We bless you that you love us. We worship you that you are with us. And we praise you that you are for us. Take all the glory, take all the praise, take all the honor. Because we ask this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. And now receive the benediction, the blessing from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, let him equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.